It's interesting in terms of martial arts, but can I use this in a self-defense situation? What's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 656. And my guest today, Sensei David Hogshead. I am Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show, founder of Whistlekick. And you know what? I love martial arts, traditional martial arts in all forms. I think they're just the best. And so that's why we've got all this stuff that we've got going on to support you, the traditional martial artist of the world. If that means something to you, if it resonates, if it clicks, whatever you want to describe it as, go to whistlekick.com, find all the things that we've got happening, the websites and the projects and the writing and you name it. Well, maybe not because there's always room for more, right? That's part of the martial arts philosophy, but there's a ton that we're doing. One of the things that we're doing, we've got a store. It's one of the ways that we fund all this stuff. If you use the code podcast15, you can save some money and help us connect the dots that, you know what, when we do this, it leads to a sale. And that's a good thing for us as we figure out where to put our resources. Speaking of resources, we have a whole separate website for the show, Whistlekick, martialartsradio.com. Two episodes each and every week, all under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining you, the traditional martial artists of the world. What are you going to find at that website? Well, you're going to find ways to listen to or watch episodes, depending on whether they're audio or video. You're going to find transcripts. You're going to find links and photos and videos related to guest episodes or anything that's going to give you more context. You can also sign up for our newsletter, whether at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com or whistlekick.com. And that's the best way to stay up on everything we've got going on, as well as really just have some great martial arts content delivered to your inbox. One, generally one a week. And you know what? It's good stuff. So check it out. Let me know what you think. Now, if you want to help us out, I mentioned, yeah, you could you can sign up for things and follow things and buy things. But you might also consider our Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. And what are you going to find on the Patreon? You're going to find exclusive and behind the scenes content, stuff you're not going to find anywhere else. You know, we put up audio episodes and video episodes and book drafts, and it depends on the tier you're in. You you do as little as two bucks a month. You know, we throw you eight episodes a month. If you want to throw us back two bucks, I mean, what's the math on that? 25 cents? If you think the episodes are worth 25 cents, you know, maybe you want to help us out on the Patreon. It all adds up, right? We put a ton into this and... There's a lot of money. So the Patreon is another way that we try to offset those costs. All right, let's talk about the guest. So Sensei David Hogsett came on and we just started chatting and it just kind of went and I look up at the clock and it's been like 45 minutes. And this is one of those episodes, if you really like the organic style episodes where I don't ask a lot of questions, it just kind of runs away like two old friends chatting about martial arts. That's what this was. Those are my favorite style episode. So I'm particularly partial to this one. So check it out. Enjoy it. Learn something. Have some fun. And I'll see you in the outro. Hello there. How are you? How are you? I'm well, thank you. Yourself? Oh, hanging in there. It's uh, yeah. been a long day. <laughs> yeah. Here in China. Yeah, you're you're a whole bunch of hours ahead. Right. A good, uh, well, <laughs> depending, where, where, where are you? Hmm. I'm I'm on the east coast of the U.S. I'm in Vermont. Oh, okay, yeah. So about the b- before daylight savings goes away, it's a uh, twelve hours, twelve hour difference. But yeah, thanks for doing this. Absolutely, I'm, 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 no, I I, I I appreciate the invitation. This is actually uh, I was telling uh, Jeremy this is my my uh, first podcast. Oh, nice, nice. Well, I'll I'll be gentle. Yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> well, uh, cool. So, and, yeah, we I met Andrew actually at an Ian Abernathy. Uh, uh, a seminar probably maybe two well, no three years ago because of mm. COVID. So about three years ago um and i believe it was in no it was in in out, just outside of philadelphia so uh because i went i've been to two abernathy seminars one was in texas and then uh the other one was in just outside of philadelphia and that and that's where i met uh, i met andrew Cool. Yeah, we, we've had a few people, if I remember correctly, that came on as a result of that meeting, his, his attendance there. You know, it's it's fun when you think about 
you know, the whole six degrees of separation <laughs> right. notion. When you take it into martial arts, I, I feel like it's not six, it's two. <laughs> yeah. Maybe three, depending on where you are. That's right. <laughs> yeah. But you, you get you get people, you know, someone like Ian, who has been in direct contact with so many people yeah. and, and is so memorable in doing so that, you know, it's... It, it makes it a lot easier to connect those dots if you want to play that game. That's right. Yeah, yeah, and and yeah, Ian's Ian's quite amazing, as I'm sure you he is. know. He he really is so so supportive and encouraging. He's yeah, he's 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 a good egg. He's a wonderful. He's been on the show. He's a wonderful balance yeah. of doing his own thing, <laughs> right. giving other people tools to do their own thing, mm -hmm. and yet not embracing the I guess, I guess the admiration or the ego that could very easily accelerate that's right for others you know he's i won't say i know him you know i've spoken with him yeah. but i do not get the sense that he's a dramatically different person now than he was say 10 years ago yeah in that respect i i i, I think that's right that, that that sounds right to me i mean i've only known him for i first encountered him in 2014 so 2014 summer yeah around 2014 and so i've been active on his website his forum and and in, interacting with him through email and and seminars and yeah he he hasn't changed and oh that's good to know yeah i thought i was right yeah I, I think you're absolutely right and he does not i mean he knows he's incredibly popular and and well known but he doesn't seem you know that that doesn't seem to affect what he's doing and, and he's <laughs> right right i mean and he and he encourages the, the 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 little people so to speak right um i just really love how he's he's not intimidated at all by other people doing similar things and his his kind of view is well if other people are doing similar things it, it'll it, it, it'll we only help each other it's not like competition is is threatening to him it's like no it just helps contribute to the broader understanding of, of practical uh, practical martial arts and i really yeah i appreciate that yeah and, and i really echo that philosophy you know if you look at what we do as martial artists how educational is it if we're practicing in a vacuum yeah right if we don't have other people to learn from practice with bounce ideas off I think there's a real detriment and not to say that, you know, you can't do some really amazing things solo, but at some point you got to get some other people in there, right. at least for, for combatives and, and, and defense. And I think he and I have similar philosophies in that, well, if you're doing something and you build on my work and it's better, well, then that motivates me to find ways to be better still. And that's why, you know, that's a, a core philosophy here at Whistlekick, you know, everything that we do, you know, if someone's going to extend it and add value to it, mm -hmm. it just motivates us to find ways to continue to improve. Exactly right. Yeah. What was it in, you said 14 that you met Ian, what was it about him or, or that opportunity? Like, why? Why did you do that? Because, you know, it takes time. And, and, you know, even if it's not ungodly expensive, it still requires money. So there was a reason, there was some motivation there for you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> My, my, I guess as with most people, you know, my, my, my martial arts journey has been quite varied. And for, for the longest time, you know, I, I was, in, you know, I have always been in the, in the traditional martial arts. And so I was in, um, as a, well, <laughs> I guess it's kind of cliche when I was a kid, uh, in, in the, the late seventies into the early eighties, you know, the, the whole fascination with Bruce Lee, and uh, the, the 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 David Carradine Kung Fu TV show. I <laughs> I was just remembering. I I even had the the Kung Fu lunchbox right um, back. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I love it. Do you, do you still have it? 
No, I, I, oh. I really, it would be worth so much now. Right. Um, it would. but it was one of those things where, you know, my parents knew I, I was always watching the, the Kung Fu TV show. So for, I, I can't remember if it was for Christmas or birthday or something, you know, they got me the lunch box and that was back when lunch boxes, you know, were a thing and they, you know, they had, you know, marketing lunch boxes anyway. Oh yeah. So I had, I remember I, <laughs> Yeah, it was great fun. Uh, and, and so I was always interested in in the martial arts and so i when i was a kid we, we actually my dad worked with the government uh u.s government uh, the corps of engineers and um we were in saudi arabia for a while and i at the at the recreation center in the compound where we lived um there was a a, a worker there who was from thailand and he was actually sort of teaching thai boxing to kids and so i started with that i mean i, I i'd seen some bruce lee movies and they were you know older kids in the compound who were, you know, they were making their own, uh, we call them nunchucks, right? But the nunchaku and, um, and they were learning uh, different sort of uh, techniques and, and ways to twirl the nunchaku um, almost like, you know, a baton or something. Right. But anyway, it was, people were, were you know, throwing side kicks and roundhouse kicks and we didn't know what the hell we were doing. Right. Um, so I decided, you know, I need to learn, some some of this stuff. So I, I started taking you know Thai boxing with uh, this this guy. Moved back to the states and 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 later was in when high in high school and you know Taekwondo was the whole thing. So all right, so I, I started uh, a training in 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 Taekwondo, and I remember I was in high school in, in Clarksville, Tennessee, and I, I, I we my mom my mom found this uh, a little taekwondo school song brown I, I still remember the 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 teacher song brown he he was like um it was a, a like a gold's gym and, and he, he had this little workout space ab- above the gold's gym and, and and a few of us from high school went and, and trained with him for a bit and that really you know piqued my interest and, and, you know, continued to, to enthrall me in the, in these martial arts, but, you know, it was still very much kind of competitions type of, 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 um, martial arts. And, you know, I, I didn't know any different. I thought this is, this is what it is. So I'm learning these forms. I'm learning these one steps and I'm just kind of learning it because, you know, song Brown said, oh, this is what we have to do. Right. And then we moved and I went to, an, uh, to Ohio and we found another, Taekwondo place that taught the same uh, forms. So I continued training there and then um, eventually went to Ohio State for, for university. And I decided, you know, uh, w- with this Taekwondo, uh, it's a lot of kicks, but I don't feel like I, I, I know how to use my hands so much. So I was looking for a club to join there at Ohio State. And uh, uh, I remember going to to the gym and I was watching a Taekwondo club and they, they were sort of doing some sparring and there were you know, lots of kicks and they got close to each other and then they would push with their hands. They would push each other away and start kicking. I'm like, well, why, why aren't you like punching them? Or why, you know, why, why, why aren't you using your hands more or something? So it just sort of dawned on me that I, I, I don't know how to use my hands. And then there was a something called the Ohio State Karate Club that start that had a class after the the Taekwondo club. So I, I watched that one, and I really liked what they were doing. They were using their hands and elbows and knees and other stuff. And so so I asked the instructor, you know, what, what is this? He's like, well, this is this is Matsubashi Shonryu. I'm like, huh? Yeah, I never heard of this before. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I started training with them and. I, I trained with them through my, my undergraduate into graduate work. And I, I was with them for, I guess, what, 10 years, uh, you know, th- b- between undergraduate and graduate studies. Um, ended up getting my uh, my uh, first degree, first through third degree black belt with with this group. You know, this is Matsubashi, uh, you know, very traditional the whole, what I guess what's often called sort of 3K, right? You've got the, the, the kata, kumite, um, and uh, kihon. Uh, kihon, right? Doing the one steps, the two steps, the three steps, all this stuff, right? But, mm. you know, that, that's kind of what, what it was all about. And then I, I got my first teaching job in New York. I went there. I, I found a, a, a Shornru group. I was training with them for a bit. Um, had to take a break. 
went into Shotokan for a while and learned about Shotokan, got, got a first degree in Shotokan, then found another Matsubashi club again and went, uh, trained with them for a bit, <clears throat> had, had to stop out for, uh, had to you know drop out for other personal reasons and was out for a long time. And I kept thinking that, you know, I, I, I need to ex- expand, explore, do other things. So I, I, I found a, um, uh, um, what was this thing? Uh, it was a Kempo group, um, uh, like I'm, uh, related to American Kempo. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I trained with them and, and it was fascinating, right? They had all these, what they called, you know, Kempos and there was something else, but they're basically like one, uh, almost like one step sparring. So I, I learned all these wild techniques, but I, there was something in the back of my mind that always kept saying, but will this, you know, it's interesting in terms of martial arts, but can I use this in a self-defense situation? And I, and I just kept, even through when I was at Ohio State, I kept having this nagging question in the back of my mind. What's the relationship between the, these Kihon exercises the one steps and three steps sparring and the kumite and the kata. You know, why, why am I learning all these kata moves, but then I can't seem to use them in my sparring. And if I try to use these kata moves in my sparring, I get punched in the face. So there's some, you know, there, <laughs> there's, there's this disconnect here and I just couldn't quite draw those, you know, I couldn't connect the dots very well. And I kept searching and searching, but was also was interesting to me, which I kind of discovered later, was that I was searching, but I didn't quite under I didn't quite realize what my question was, right? If if that makes sense. Um I, I knew there was something lacking. I knew I was missing something, but I didn't know what the question was to lead me to the answers to help me connect those dots. Mm. Um, I, I guess that's the best way I can, I, I can explain that. Um, I had this sense that I'm missing something, but I didn't quite know what the question was. Um, and then I was just, you know, surfing around on, on, on the internet, on YouTube. And, and I, and to this day, I can't remember what, how I got to an Ian Abernathy YouTube video. But one day I, I, I discovered Ian Abernathy, you know, <laughs> however that was, I, I really, I can't remember how that was, you know, and how that happened. But I'm, wa- I'm watching a, a, you know, a, a video of him talking about uh, bunkai application. And, 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 and when I was at the Ohio State Club, you know, we, we talked about bunkai, we had bunkai, and, um, you know, some of it was, was, uh, was practical, others less so. But, you know, I understood what, what Bunkai was. Um, and so I'm watching this. I'm like, oh, suddenly things started to click. And then I realized what the question was that I that was kind of nagging me, but I didn't quite know what it was. And that question was, what is the practical application of these particular moves within the kata. Um, and why is it that these movements don't seem to work in long distance kumite context, right? Well, it's because it's not intended for that. It, you know, kumite, as I understood it and, and practice, it was sports oriented. The kata was never intended to be for for kind of sport co- uh, uh, combat or or you know consensual combat between martial artists and and also there was close range and once i once that all kind of clicked i'm like oh and there was another when he was talking when ian Abernathy was talking about um the uh, hikate, the, the the pulling hand, because I because I always had that question too. You know, why, why is my hand at this hip here? Because my head's all open. <laughs> you know, um, this just doesn't make sense to me. So anyway, I, I started watching his videos, and, and and things just started to click and to make so much sense 
that, all right, I, I realized, okay, there's, a, there's so much more to the traditional karate, the matsubashi that I had been studying that I had not been able to explore. And I wanted to explore that. And so I, I start, you know, I, I started to, I talked with the, the, the senseis at the, at the Kimpo karate where I was, you know, training at it. I said, you know, I, I think I, I need to, I need to go back to my roots here and explore some of the practical applications of, of Matsubashi. And they, and they understood. And so it turned out I, I found uh, the uh, um, uh, uh, Shornru Karate Do International, SRKDI, uh, in, in Long Island, New York, where I was, um, headed by Jerry Figiani, uh, Sensei Figiani. And um, he, he was, expo- he had trained under, uh, um, um, Patrick McCarthy and a bunch of other folks. But anyway, he was doing much more practical applications of the kata, which is exactly what I was looking for. And so I started training uh, uh, with him and his organization. And then that kind of opened up a whole bunch of things for me. Um, and, and then, you know, I connected with Ian um, on his website. I, uh, he was giving seminary, he find, it, it was coming to America. And so, I, you know, there were two opportunities, one, one in Texas, one in, in, in outside of Philadelphia. I was able to go and train with him. And, and so that, that, that had just, that has influenced you know, what I've been doing since two, 2014 so significantly. And it's like, wow, I've got so much to explore and so much to, to, to study now. So it's really exciting. Hmm. That's really cool. You know, uh, say what you will about YouTube, but, you know, that algorithm once in a while gives us some pretty amazing stuff. <laughs> it, it, it really does. And, and, and of course it does. It, it can never replace, um, you know, in, in person um, partner training. No, no, of course not. But wow, can it really open up, um, you know, modes of inquiry, ideas. It can, mm. it, it, it can, it can really encourage people to explore things more deeply, it sort of gives them, um, as my dad would say, like an inspirational kick in the pants. You know, it's kind of like you can start to see what other people are doing in other parts of the world and realize, oh, I'm missing out on something here. Let me, let me figure out how I can start participating in that. Mm. I, I like the way you put it about knowing or feeling like there was a question. There were answers missing, but you didn't know the question. Yeah. Because I think a lot of us have have had that feeling, this notion that something there's there's a piece missing, and not that it's a, a large piece, but it's a significant piece. You know, I, I I often think about martial arts training like Trivial Pursuit. You know, if you've played Trivial Pursuit, you know what does your piece look like? You've got all those different pies, and of course, in martial arts, those pies aren't all the same mm-hmm. uh, width. But if you're running around the board after having played for a while, trained for a while, and you're missing one piece, you, you can't finish the game. And that feeling of frustration of yeah. there's a there's a piece I'm missing here. Yeah. There, there was and, like and, Yeah, there, there was like an emptiness. There was like, all right, I'm getting really good at kata, but to what end? Um, I'm getting really good at one step and three step sparring, but why? But but to one end. Um, I'm I'm fairly good now at you know kumite and 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 so I, I don't you know I, I kind of discovered I didn't like the the point the, the the like the the sports the point sparring right because it's like well there's certain techniques that I would do I would have absorbed this and follow through but. They, they called they called a point. I have to stop now. I thought, this is too artificial. I don't like this. But I, I kept thinking, all right, but how are these things related? Um, I, I can't think of why, why, why are we doing this kata for however many, you know, minutes during, during the workout? Okay, we're doing kata. We're talking about body dynamics and snap and stances and, and pivoting hips and stuff. Okay almost like a form for form's sake. And then we would shift to, now it's time to do self-defense, right? Okay, so we're doing wrist release and knife defenses and all that stuff. But 
well, how is that related to the kata? And what, you know, what is this? It, it was, it was one of those things where I, I, I always had that nagging question, but it, but, you know, just based upon how, you know, a lot of traditional dojos are, are arranged, you, you, you're not necessarily encouraged to ask those questions. Um, until you kind of get into the black belt ranks and you've got special black belt classes and then you can kind of discuss things. But even then it was kind of like, well, no, 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 the, you know, the, the, the kata is, uh, here is, is just kind of like exercise and form and snap and body dynamics and self-defense. We're going to work on things over here. I'm like, okay. So I was just kind of led to believe that there was really wasn't much relationship between those kata and, and the self-defense, yet at the same time, we were exploring Bunkai, and there were a few moves from the kata where they would kind of relate it to self-defense. But then there were still other self-defense stuff we would work on that had it seemed to have nothing whatsoever to do with, with the kata. And I just always felt there's something missing here. Um, but yeah, and, and so it, it wasn't until I started in, you know, looking at you know, Ian's material and, and uh, at, at, you know, when I first encountered him, he, you know, he had DVDs and so I was buying his DVDs, I was buying his books and all this stuff. And I started reading them, like reading and watching his videos, like, oh my God, that's what I've been missing. And and mm. so, yeah, so I've been <laughs> developing stuff, uh, you know, since then. And, and now it just makes so much more sense. And, and it's sort of like one of those things where, on the one end, I feel like, man, it's almost like I've wasted so much time. And, and I don't say that, um, you know, maliciously at all. I mean, that, that's not my intent. Um, but it's just, it seemed like there, there for many, many years, um, you know, I was just training almost like for the sake of training just to get good at kata, but to what end? But now I feel like, okay, now, now I, I can see what, how I can work on stuff. Um, and relate it to, you know, partner training that, that the, the, the kata is basically, at least how I understand it, the, the, the kata is like a summary of partner drills. And if you don't have a partner, the kata, is, it gives you an opportunity to train those moves without a partner, but it's never intended to replace partner training, right? It, 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 it's just, yeah. and, and when COVID hit, it, it, it suddenly the everyone who who were, were kind of bashing kata and solo training, saying it's impractical, it doesn't really help you when you train. Suddenly, <laughs> right? Suddenly, like, oh, we need we need solo training drills. <clears throat> it's called kata, <laughs> yeah. right? right. <laughs> but uh, the, the idea of of this discussion, you know, the applicability, the relevance of forms within the martial arts, it. it it comes up on on every martial arts show, and then you know we talk about it from time to time here. That e even though we have a little bit of selection bias, in that we are a traditional martial arts show, the majority of our guests and our topics are rooted in principles that would not argue against forms. But we've still had guests on the show who, you know, they're they're not fans and they don't mm. teach them or they don't train them. Mm. But I, I think that you and I are very much on the same page in that that is a mistake. Yeah, because if if we were to make a list, let, let's let's even take the application out of it. Let's forget about bunkai of kata for a moment. Mm -hmm. Let's make a list of all the things that anybody would want to have in terms of self defense. Well, you should be strong and have good cardiovascular conditioning mm -hmm. and good balance, and you should be able to deploy your techniques without having to think about them. And you should have flexibility and speed and, and, and. And if you practice your forms in various ways and with intensity and understanding, you build all of those things. Yeah. So why not? Yeah. Right? Like, if, if, oh, I'm going to go over here and do this flexibility drill. And I'm going to go over here and do this strength drill. And I'm going to go over here and do this. Well, you could do them all at once. Maybe not as well as those individual things. But, mm -hmm. you know, I can sit down and spend five minutes doing a, a couple forms with immense intensity and be exhausted. Right, right. And really get a lot of benefit from it. Mm -hmm. It's not separate. It all it all blends together. It's, you know, you, you express the three Ks of, of karate. Kihon, 
Kata Kumite. And I think people look at those as, as having, you know, hard commas <laughs> in between them. And, and, and I see it more as hyphens. Yes. Well, the, the way they're, they have been presented for so many years, dec- so many decades, they have been presented with hard commas. Um, that's how, you know, I learned them. The, you know, they were separate things. Um, and there didn't seem to be any relationship whatsoever. And, and if there were relationship, it was mainly the the um, kihon would be an opportunity to isolate specific techniques in the kata, and you can drill them up and down the floor to perfect the form, and then allow you to perform them within the kata. That that was pretty much the extent of it, right? So, so in that sense, and, and, and then, you know, that high block, you could never pull off a high block in sparring. You know, that didn't work, right? <laughs> right. right. No, nobody's going to give you the attack that, that awards a high <laughs> yeah. block. And if, yeah. they, and if they do, they're not going to last long. Right. And, 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 and even if you tried, it's like, even if the jab, if you're doing the, the wind up and then high block, I, I, I've been punched in the face at least twice before I can pull that off. Right? So you learn real quick that, Okay, that doesn't seem to apply to to uh, to to Kumite, and in many ways it doesn't because it's not intended to be right. Because that high block isn't necessarily a block; it could be a throat strike or a smash in the side of the head. I mean, it could be in so many other things, right? Um, and but w- once once that clicked for me when I realized that. Okay, the way this has been constructed as quote unquote traditional karate, it's actually not traditional. Um, it's contemporary. It was a contemporary misunderstanding of what traditional was supposed to be. And I think that's incredibly ironic. Um, and then the t- true traditional karate was all about. Uh, as I understand it, from Ian, from from Jerry Fijani, and, and from Patrick McCarthy, particularly with his translation of the Bubishi, um, is that it's actually civilian combat, civilian self defense combat, right? So, if if, if that's the case, then we we've, we've been artificially constructing something that we think is traditional, but it's really not. And and the traditional stuff, the traditional karate or traditional martial arts, is actually more like MMA <laughs> than, than people might want to think, right? Um, so I don't know. I, I just think it's a. It was almost as if my whole martial arts universe was turned upside down. But then I realized, no, it wasn't turned upside down. It's actually turned upside right. So that mm. so that I now understand what it was really intended to be, and then that just opened up all kinds of opportunities uh, uh, for for study and exploration. And now the kata are, are so much richer, and I think I don't know if I'm going to be able to to explore everything in this lifetime, <laughs> you know, now, given given what I now understand and know about what these forms are are about. I'm like. I, I wish I could do this. Full- that, that's what Ian did, right? I mean, he was an electrician and then he just, he's going to do this full time. Well, I, I can't do that, right? So I don't know if I'm going to be able to, to explore, <laughs> but that's also kind of exciting because I know I, I'll, I'll never, um, I'll never exhaust the possibilities and the potentialities of, of this hobby, for the lack of a better term. I don't like to use that word because that kind of seems as though it's just entertainment and it's much more than that, right? Sure. But it, it's kind of exciting to know that I, I there will always be something more to learn. And that was always instilled in me. And, and most traditional martial arts, I'll say, when you reach that you know black belt level, that actually means now you're ready to learn. Right, you know everything you did. A lot of people think, "Oh, you got your black belt, you're finished." Uh, no, that's actually the beginning. It's kind of like commencement. 
and, and you know, like graduation, commencement, we call it a commencement because that means beginning. Now you're, now you can begin to do what it is you're supposed to do. Right. Well, it's, it, it's the same way with when you achieve your black belt, it's kind of a commencement. And now you're ready to really learn, but it wasn't until I discovered this other approach to, to bunkai and practical application that I felt like, okay, now I'm, now I'm actually learning stuff that I'm supposed to be. Because before it was just fine tuning body dynamics. And I'm like, how is that helping me? I don't, you know, that, that. I didn't feel like I was really progressing uh, as a, as a black belt. Um, but now I feel like, okay, this is what it means to be a black belt where I can actually make it my own. I can start to um, explore, learn, but also give back. I can start to contribute to, to knowledge building and, and, and um, offering my own perspective to the larger body of knowledge, if that makes sense. It does. It does. When you, when you when you look at this, let's say more nuanced current sort of attitude towards martial arts, towards your, your karate training, and you look back, you know, you, you talked about not upside down, but maybe right side up. Mm -hmm. Was was there a point as the in the midst of that? I don't know if we can call it a transition, but let, let, let's do so just because I think it's probably a simpler word. Um, in the midst of that, was there frustration or sorrow or I wish I'd known? Were you kicking yourself? Were you mad at instructors? You know, was there anything like that that came? It sounds like if so, you would have worked past it. But I'm wondering about in those that that short period of time. I actually no. Um, I, I I felt a a, a brief sense of grief uh, and a sense of loss, mm. but I also recognized that my 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 own instructor instructors they were working with the best that they knew and understood in their context. Right, I, I felt it, it would be arrogant and and presumptuous of me to somehow blame them because I also recognize I got a solid foundation. They taught me very well what they knew um, and, and, and in the context of what they knew. Um, and I also recognize, particularly with when I was at the Ohio State Karate Club, it was part of the, it was called the ASKA, the American Shonen Karate Association. Um, in many ways, I can look back now and see they were kind of they, they were in many ways on the cutting edge because they were already thinking about bunkai practical application even though they were still very much steeped in the whole 3k karate traditional karate phenomena because that's everyone was that, that's what that's what we were handed right that's what we were given post world war ii what else could we have of that right um and so i felt it would be very unjust and unfair of me to somehow criticize them or be angry with them for giving me something that they didn't necessarily have themselves right but at the same time, I could look back and see, and I, and I could start to see, oh, wait a minute. M my instructors were actually already trying to make those connections themselves. Um, even within the 3K where these things are separated, but I can still go back and remember, oh yeah, they, they looked at Pinan Sandan as a wrist release. They looked at the opening moves of, you know, Pinan Shodan, what we called, you know, the, the, the Shodakan would call that Hei Anidan. Uh, but anyway, you know, the, the, the Pinans, they were already, oh, he's looking at that as a, as a, 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 a bear hug from, from behind release, right? Um, th this instructor taught that as a uh, cross grab wrist release. Um, this, this particular, uh, uh, we looked at that move as a uh, potential release of a, ch of a chokehold. So I could see glimpses of where they were kind of 
grasping in the dark, so to speak, where they were recognizing, no, there are actually some practical applications of this, right? And so I actually ended up feeling um, indebted and, and actually had gratitude that they instilled within me a desire to try and figure out a practical application for some of these moves, even if I didn't quite realize that's what I was grasping for, or that, that's what I was searching for. They still kind of laid a bit of a foundation for that. And I'm still, even though I'm in a, a different organization now, I'm still in touch with, with uh, you know, some, some of my, my uh, senseis from, you know, a few decades ago. Um, and I can see when I re kind of reconnected, they also have developed and grown and they've been very supportive of me, you know, liking certain videos that I put up, um, you know, and, and acknowledging that, you know, that I'm working with Ian Abernathy and other folks in these sort of practical um, application circles, um, you know, that because because they themselves have also were expanding and, and contributing in those different ways. So um, I, I know I, I've, I've heard other people talk and, and I know some organizations are still very strident in just keeping things the way they've always been, um, not acknowledging you know, maybe ways in which they ha have not been as practical as they, as they could be or whatever, whatever. But I think I, I've, I, I count myself very fortunate that I've, I've been involved with organizations, even in, in the distant, you know, in, in the past, you know, several decades ago, um, when I was first starting in, in traditional karate, where they were, they were starting to try and make those connections. Um, and so I, mm -hmm. I actually, I actually feel quite fortunate, um, that uh, um, yeah, I, I had that experience. Even though I was still searching and wondering what's the connection here, they were still, you know, they they were trying to make those connections as best they they could at that point. And I don't know if any of them are going to listen or hear this, but you know, I, I hope I'm I'm being you know you know fair and 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 how I represent them. But I really do appreciate um, the foundations that they provided. Um, yeah. And you're not alone, you know, plenty of us, I would say the majority of us by numbers had an experience kind of like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm not saying necessarily that we all came up feeling like there was a, an unasked question that we needed to answer. You know, you're, you're not definitely not alone there. Mm -hmm. But I think we often forget in the West, the majority of us started learning martial arts from people who trained for very, very little time. Right. That's right. And our lineages go back to military service right. with, um, you know, a few years. Right. And if your job is an, as an instructor, you know, think about it as, I don't know, the, the way the way Krav Maga is taught the Israeli military. What is it? Six, a six week program? You know, mm -hmm. they're not going to give you everything. That's right. If you've got a year, two years, even four years, and this is all you have, this person is leaving when they are done, you've got to give them the most you can, the best you can, and that's not everything. Right. And what tends to fall off in a simplified explanation or presentation, it's detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and plus what the service, the service personnel brought back, um, was more sport or, you know, children's karate. <laughs> um, and, 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 you know, where, where all the, the practical stuff was kind of stripped out because they were teaching it to, to children and, and college students and weren't necessarily giving them the original um, sort of deadly aspects or, or you know, the, the real combative aspects for it. Um, and, and those service personnel didn't know that. Um, and then so much is lost in translation. I mean, we, so, um, I've been very fortunate to be, to be able to go to Okinawa with, with, uh, uh Sensei Jerry Fujiani and go to our Hombo, um, dojo in, in Okinawa there and, and do some training. And it becomes very apparent to me how much is lost in translation. Right. Um, 
and, and you know, so you're calling things blocks or translating into blocks when it's not necessarily, you know, it should have maybe been translated as received or, you know, th- these types of things where it gets because of the, the, the language issues, it, it gets entrenched as, oh, this is, this is a block. And then you start making everything into a block. Well, well no, that's not what that was intended. And then, you know, in, in our, uh, my lineage with Matsubashi, um, you know, the, the, uh, 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 masters that we were kind of working with after uh, Soshi Nagamine, uh, some of his direct students, you know, they were saying, well, you know, because so many in Matsubashi take, you know, Nagamine's book as, you know, gospel, right? Um, this is all you need and, and you can't change anything. You have to follow this. And his direct students you know, are telling us, you know, he, he didn't put everything in there. It was, this is just scratching the surface. And, you know, they're, they're, and could we would ask them about application and stuff. And he's like, yeah, yeah, no, there are so many different applications. He says, use your imagination. Use, and, and that's a very different, you know, the, the Okinawan mindset is very different from, you know, mainland Japan and very different from, from a, you know, kind of a Western, pers- a, a, a Western, Oh, how, how should I put this delicately? Um, there, there are many folks. <laughs> there are many folks in the West who kind of idealize. There, there are mar- like Western martial artists who will uh, maybe idealize or maybe you know, deify is maybe too strong of a word, but idolize. We'll, we'll over idolize figures in the East and not realize that well no no they're 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 human also and and they're only giving a certain portion of it and they're fallible as well right but they will kind of idealize certain things and say this is gospel and we can't do anything different when they never intended that right um and 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 it's like wait a minute you're 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 cutting yourself off you're limiting yourself by saying you must do it exactly like this picture in the book well that's a snapshot of one moment of a, of an entire movement and 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 he never you know nagimini never intended you to just do that only and and we're, we're talking with his direct students who are saying no no use your imagination develop your own applications you know make this your own I'm like, thank you, but can you, <laughs> can you tell more people that? Because you know, we're, yeah. we're you know, they're, they're busting our balls here about you know you're changing the style. Like, no, I'm not. I mean, I, I'm trying to explore it and enhance it and develop and grow. And yeah, anywho, <laughs> we we've had a couple of people come on the show and talk about martial arts with an analogy of language. Mm that you know the key on the basics uh maybe words or sentences and a form might be a poem Mm -hmm. um and and i was reminded of that when you said imagination use your imagination if if i was an english teacher and i was trying to teach people language right like i i might i might take sentences we might break them down depending on the level of of the class we might review forms as poetry right like like there's a lot of ways that you can you can draw some analogs there and when you mentioned imagination that really reminded me of that and i i think that's an important piece to remember because otherwise the only books i could ever write would be books i've read and how boring does that get? The only, oh, I, w- I would never actually create anything. And for me, when I break down the concept of martial arts, right, the, the noun in there is art. There is a creative element to art. And if there isn't, well, then my, my personal view, not that my definition is better than anyone else's, but in my personal view, if you don't have the opportunity to inject some creativity, you're missing out. No, you're you're absolutely right, and it's funny you should make that connection because I, I, I'm actually a, an English professor here. Oh, cool! Um, yeah. <laughs> and I often, you know, in my own mind, I, I think of kata as as poems. Um, and and what's interesting in um, sort of theories of literary interpretation, there's um, particularly in more contemporary theories, there's something called the the intentional fallacy. 
where they talk about, oh, it, it's it's um, a, a, an error to try and determine what the author originally intended in this poem or story or novel, because you can never really verify uh, with them, either they're dead or if they're still alive, they're, they're not going to necessarily uh, try and confirm your interpretation. They'll just say, well, it, it, it's, it's up to you, you figure it out. Well, as much as that's true, we, we still can't deny that authors had intentions whenever they decided to write something. And we have enough information, in my view, we have enough information from the text and other texts that those particular writers may have written, and then historical and sociological and other types of things, we can get sufficient knowledge of what we think they were intending to say. We might not know absolutely, but we can have sufficient understanding, right? And so I, I, I take that same perspective to Kata. Yeah, so the, we don't know other than, you know, Anko Itosu and, and the Pinans and, and so on. We, we, but generally speaking, we, we can't confirm with the original creators of these Kata what they were intending. But we can study the movements and study the forms and, and study other writings and come up with some sufficient knowledge and understanding of what they are intending, number one. But in in in, in interpretive theory, we, we have what's called meaning, which is this is what the author intended to the best of our understanding. But then there's also significance. How do we apply that text to our lives and our context? Well, we can do the same thing with kata. We can try and figure out, okay, here's this you know, high block, step punch, pivot, low block. We can try and figure out what the original designer of this kata might have been intending. And that would be meaning of the kata, but we can also explore its significance. How can we apply that to our contemporary context? How might we use that same movement within our understanding today of legal requirements and uh, what are, what are the what what you know McCarthy, Patrick McCarthy talks about habitual acts of violence? What what are the habitual acts of violence that we commonly see today? Um, and how are um, you know? criminals dressing today and, and what types of clothes. So we, we can then apply those movements to our context. And so for me, that kind of opens up the kata to these um, amazing richness where we can try and figure out originally, maybe this is what the, the creator of this kata was intending, but we can also then explore a bunch of other possibilities where that, that where we can bring in these other martial arts is like, ooh, I'm noticing this this jujitsu move. That looks a lot like this move in my kata. I can maybe make that work, you know, in, in, in this particular move. Or ooh, there's a judo throw and that pivot into a low block looks a lot like that judo throw. So maybe we, so that's what I like to do with, with the kata and, and use your imagination and, and sort of break out of that stilted, confining, you must do it exactly like Nagamine is picturing in his in his book. Like, well, if you if you look at how he and his son and those the 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 the, the kata change over time with you know so you that it can change with you as well. You're not changing the kata, you're just exploring different, you know, possibilities of how to apply that kata. Yeah. We're we're on the same page. I, I want to take a hard left because we got we got some other stuff I want to make sure that we talk about. And, and the first thing is <laughs> is you know we we mentioned at the top that you're you're not in the U.S. You're you're in China, and then you mentioned you're an English professor. Is that is that why you're there? Are those those dots connected? Yeah, yes, and so well, my my wife is a Chinese national, and we've been married for about um, uh, eleven years now. 
And, uh, you know, she's been out of her country for a long time. Uh, and so we decided it was time to try and get back, uh, you know, to, to her country and be closer to, you know, her side mm. of the family and so on. And, and so I was able to get a, a position at a, uh, a Sino American university where I, I, I direct the, uh, the, um, school of English studies at, um, Winzhou Kane university in, in Winzhou, China, which is in kind of the Southern, just near, near, near Taiwan. Um, and so that's kind of the motivation there. And, and so, yes, yeah, so I'm an English, English professor here uh, in China. Oh, cool. Okay. And what was that, that transition like for you and your, your martial arts training? I mean, that's it's kind of big and, and, you know, let's face it, you're a, you're a karate guy and now in China and um, While I'm sure there's plenty of karate, I'm going to guess that it's a, a smaller percentage than Chinese martial arts. Right. It's, it's actually quite fascinating because, um, well, I've, we've been here only uh, 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 about a month and a half. So it, it's a recent move. Um, and um, there isn't, they're actually on campus, there, there is not a traditional karate organization or club. Ta there's Taekwondo. Um, you know, Taekwondo is everywhere. <laughs> they, 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 they've done a great job of marketing. And just, anyway, so there's Taekwondo. There's some, um, uh, like a, a Chinese kind of wrestling, uh, type of, of group on campus. Um, and, you know, there's Tai Chi and, and, and so on. Uh, but it, it's, it, it's the martial arts in China now is actually quite interesting because, you know, post Mao and post uh, uh, Cultural Revolution, um, the the martial arts uh, in China changed from a, a, a kind of a self defense, com you know, s civil combat type of thing to exercise and personal development, mm. and and that largely, my understanding, had to do with uh, kind of the communist government trying to. Um, you know, keep keep the, the the civilian population from having you know military and, and combative potential like like just like you know they took their guns away and so on right so um, they changed the martial arts into something that's more about exercise um, and and good health and so on and so that's often what you see now there are pockets of of individuals here who still retain the knowledge of how to apply things and and what i'm sensing or seeing is we're seeing more of that now right where, where people are starting to talk a little bit more about yep tai chi is this about exercise and breathing and energy and this, but there's also all kinds of applications there so we're starting to see that the other thing that i find fascinating is is um you know, karate, of course, comes from from you know Okinawan in, indigenous Okinawan uh, uh, martial arts, but heavily influenced by by Chinese martial arts, because with the Ryukyu Kingdom before Japan took over, you know, the Ryukyu Kingdom, there was a close connection between Okinawa and uh, uh, China, particularly um, the uh, uh, you know uh, Fujian. Um, is that right? The White Crane, uh, the, so the, the, like the southern uh, parts of China, closer, you know, closer to Okinawa. So you have this cultural exchange between the Chinese martial arts and the Okinawan martial arts. Uh, and so I'm, I'm actually get, getting a kick out of exploring some of those connections and, and trying to talk to people and see, oh, look, we there, there's this... Um, you know, um, Sanchin kata, and that looks a lot like that kata you're doing there. Or there are these moves in that particular form that look a lot like this move in this particular kata. Um, and so I, I'm uh, I'm really interested in trying to explore some of those connections, uh, looking at some of the the uh, historical roots, the Chinese historical roots of how that influenced the, the uh, Okinawan karate. Hmm. Really cool. And and do I am I are my notes right? You wrote a book. Did I get yes, that right? Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah, so there's, there's another hard left. 
Because <laughs> let, let, let's let's face it, I I think I asked you something about a lunchbox, and then forty five minutes later we pivoted. So we're we're not we're <laughs> we're not we're not going to get through everything. And I love these sort of conversations, the ones where it just it just flows, it just runs away from us because it tells me that there there's a lot there. And it gets my wheels turning, and I'm assuming it gets the audience's yeah. wheels turning. Hopefully yours as well. But I want to yeah, make I'll sure ask. that if you wrote a book, that we talk about your book because people might want oh, to pick thank, it up. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's called uh, Training Ronin Style: uh, Principles, Tips, and Strategies for Practical Martial Arts Solo Practice. So I, I, I had had this idea uh, for this book for many years, largely because when I started to feel this sense of disconnect and I couldn't quite figure out where I belong and how can I train, I was doing a lot of training on my own. And so I, I felt very much like a Ronin, right? Mm. Just, just this, this warrior without a home and, but still having a, a sense of a warrior spirit and a, and a, and a warrior framework. And, but I just didn't know where I belonged. And, and so I just started exploring things on my own. I thought, yeah, maybe I maybe I can write a book about this. And so I had some notes and this and that where I you know, was writing some ideas and here and there. And then, um, you know, COVID hits and people are locked down. Dojos and gyms are closed. And suddenly... I realized, and this and this is also um, uh, encouragement from from Ian Abernathy on one of his one of his uh, videos and podcasts. He was talking about, yeah, this this time is really challenging, and um, we can't train with partners, and and a lot of people are losing you know their jobs or at least being laid off, and these horrible things economically. So, but we should try and how can we reframe this time and reclaim this time and, and try and explore and do things that we didn't have time to do before. And I'm like, oh, I can write that book. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, and, and, it, and, it was, and then I thought, it's perfect because people are clamoring for... Uh, and I had a conversation with, with Ian uh, um, and also with, with you know, my sensei, uh, Jerry Fijiani, and, and they were both like, yeah, the, we, we need a book like that, right? And people need this type of guidance. It's, it's one thing to tell people, yeah, train on your own, but most people aren't used to that. And they, you know, they need some kind of structure. They need ideas. They need recommendations on what to do and how to do it. And so like, boom, all right. So I cranked out this book and, um, I wrote up, you know, several chapters on it. And I, you know, my, my wife took pictures, uh, of, of me illustrating different things. And, you know, I was able to put it together and, and get it published. And, uh, yeah. And so it, it came out and it's actually fairly well received. I've got some good responses from it. And, Particularly, you know, during lockdown, uh, pe you know, people have been picking it up and using it. But also, I, I, I frame it in such a way that, yeah, e even if you're, you're, um, like in the introduction to the book, I talk about different reasons for why we, we would need to do solo training, and it's not just, you know, if, if you're on lockdown. Um, e even if you're in a very vibrant, um, uh, you know, kind of dojo or you know, martial arts uh, uh, um, school, you, 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 you should be training on your own. It, it, you shouldn't just be going to, 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 to the, the class, listening to the, 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 the instructor or sensei and doing what they say and then going home. And no, you, you, you still need to follow up and do homework and do your own training. And so I talk about that or, or sometimes people find themselves in a context where, all right, they really, they've established like a, a, a nice social environment for themselves. They love the people they're training with, but maybe they're not exploring everything that they would like. Well, your solo training can be an opportunity for you to explore those other aspects of the martial arts that maybe you you, you can't do uh, in your uh, partner training or, or in your you know in, in your dojo or, or or in your 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 formal classes. So you know that can be a, a supplement to your to your other training. So yeah, there there are many different ways in which this 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 book can be used uh, to help supplement your partner training. But I make it very clear that you know solo training is never intended to replace partner training. You in terms of 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 um, practical martial arts and, and applying 
uh, your, your techniques, you have to do partner training with varying degrees of compliance, right? From, from, you know, very compliant up to non-compliant, uh, you know, training, right? Um, you, 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 you can't, um, skip that. Um, but there's definitely a, a significant place for solo training for every martial artist. And that's what the book, uh, the, the book, um, addresses, but with an eye towards practical application, how can we take these different techniques from your forms, from your kata, um, that you would normally practice with a, a training partner? How can you, um, supplement that partner training with different types of solo training? Um, so you can st still get that kind of practice. in. so that's what the book's about. Nice. Where would people find it? Uh, you can go to Amazon. Okay. Uh, they, there's both um, a Kindle version and also a print version. Okay. Um, and uh, there's um, and you can get it if you're uh, you know all over, right? So uh, uh, North America, Europe, Japan, okay, Australia. Cool. cool. Is it? Yeah, is yeah, there a link more. from your website? Uh, yes. Right. Uh, there's a definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. On the but we we right want to make it easy side. for everyone. That, let's, that's right. Let's make let's make yeah. it easy. Uh, cool. Cool. So, but, and let's, let's do that now. Website, social media, email, like any of that stuff you want to share with people, let's make sure they have all that. Sure. So, um, my, my main website is, um, shornru karate.club. Okay. So shornru karate.club. And then that one, um, there, you know, there's all kinds of information there and, and, and it, you know, in, including on, on the margin there, there's a, um, a, a link to to the book awesome well i i appreciate then, oh, then, oh, keep going then, oh keep going yeah and then on youtube i've got like a bunch of videos where i kind of illustrate some of these things you can find those uh those videos on the website uh on under the videos tab or you can go to um youtube and look up uh david hogsett um, I've got my, uh, a YouTube channel there where you can, uh, uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and see a bunch of videos. Uh, I, you know, when I, in my previous, uh, college, uh, you know, I was teaching a, uh, a PE class. And so I've got some, some videos on, uh, teaching, you know, practical applications of, uh, some Pinan Kata. I've also got a bunch of, you know, solo training videos uh, that people can look at. Um, now that I'm in China, I finally, uh, there's a, a martial arts room in the gym on campus. So I'm starting to, um, you know, create some videos on some, some new, new, uh, um, solo training I'm doing. And I'm, I'm hoping to, to, to start a, a club here, um, uh, maybe next semester, cause I'm still trying to get acclimated you know, to living in China mm. and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm doing the, there's like a, a talent show coming up here soon. So I, I, there's another professor here who uh, um, does martial arts. So we're going to do a little uh, a demonstration of, you know, practical applications of some moves from uh, you know, Pinan Shodan. And I'm hoping that that will maybe spark some interest and maybe I can get some, some students together and we can start a club maybe next semester or something. Oh, cool. But, yeah. I hope that works out. Nice. Thank you. Nice. Well, we, we've we've been all over the place today. We've really we've traveled a bit, literally, figuratively. <laughs> well, I don't know if we've literally traveled, but we've we've traveled through subjects. And I would imagine that anybody who's listening is finding quite a bit of themselves in your journey, because your journey has spanned uh, quite a few different aspects and thought processes and everything. So, what do you want to say to them? You know, we're we're wrapping up here. This is your chance to to send them off into the world with, you know, your final words. Let's say by the book. Yeah. You know, then those would be yeah. your final words. Uh, but, you know, what what do you want to say? Yeah. Well, one, I would say, um, in, in, in embrace where you are in your current journey in the martial arts. Um, I would also say try not to be too hard on, on, on yourself. Um, it's really easy sometimes, I think, to, 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 to beat ourselves up about, um, oh, I haven't done enough or I haven't explored this. You know, just recognize the martial arts are so vast. There's so much to learn. Um, just take it in, in, 
in little bits and explore. I, I, it, it's kind of like uh, I, I would rather swim in a deep, deep ocean than skip along shallow puddles, right? Um, and and it, so in order to do that, you, you, you take time and don't worry if, if you're not you, sometimes you feel like you're not doing enough. You're not exploring enough. No, just just you know, take it in little bits. Um, if 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 you're new to to kind of the practical application of things, just start with one one form, one kata. Just start exploring, start tinkering, and and, and just you know kind of do it. Um, and I guess another encouragement was w- would be. Don't fear change. Don't fear stepping out. Or you know, I guess don't fear closing a door because I, I really believe that whenever you close a door, there's always another one that's opening. Um, and th- and that was something that I struggled with. You know, it, it took me a while to think. Yeah, I, I, I've got to go back to my roots. Or I've got to. You know, it was great that I explored certain things, but I. I I've got to close this chapter and start a new chapter. I, I, I've got to take that next step and explore certain things. So a lot of times we can close ourselves off to exploring new things and making connections. So I would I would just encourage people to you know don't don't be afraid to open to, to close certain doors. Uh, and, and not to feel like that's been a waste. I don't think anything is ever really a, a waste. There's always some kernel of truth or some foundation that's been laid that you can always build upon. Um, and, I, and that's been important for me is recognizing that, you know, yep, okay, so I haven't been doing practical things for very long, but there's a solid foundation that I can build on, and it's never too late. Um, to try and explore that. And if you're in a situation where you're just not getting what you think and feel you really want, make a change. Uh, you know, that's on you. Make, you know, make a change and don't be afraid uh, of, of making that change because it's, you, you, you get out of the martial arts, whatever you put into it. Um, and so you really have to make those concerted efforts um, to invest in it. Um, and and to keep growing, keep exploring, and 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 I, I see a lot of people who who tend to get either bogged down or boxed into organizations or what or or what they think of as though this is what traditional. No, what 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 we think of as traditional is what we've constructed now as our own idea of what is quote unquote traditional martial arts. And I, and I think a lot of times we get it wrong. <laughs> so I, I'd be like, when you, when you look back in history and see there's cross training, and, you know, people visiting other masters and they weren't worried about patches and organizations and styles and all, you know, I don't know. That's, that's too limiting. Um, you know, just open one's mind and, and learn as much as possible. You know, take what works for you and, you know, I- ignore what doesn't. And, and, and don't feel bad if you're not like this person. You know, work on what you're, where you are at this moment and, and do your thing. David's certainly not the only one that spent time trying to find the question that he knew he needed answers to. I think a lot of us have that experience. Maybe it's in martial arts. Maybe it's in some other aspect of life. But the thing that I really like about his story, at least as it relates to that element, is that he was willing to keep an open mind and look until finally he found something that put him on the path to the answer. I think all too often, again, could be martial arts or something else, we close the door. I looked, I looked, I looked, I looked. I can't find it. Fine, I'm going to move on. Honestly, that's the genesis of Whistlekick. I was looking for something that didn't exist. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I looked. Instead of giving up, I said, fine, I'm going to provide the answer for myself. And if you're listening, of course, you also find some value in that provision. So, David, thanks for coming on. Had a great, great chat. Hope we do it again. And... I appreciate you telling your story. Hopefully you're still listening, audience. 
I want you to go check out the show notes for this episode. We got a bunch of photos over there. I want you to check out David's book. Super cool stuff that he's doing. And I want you to check out whistlekick.com and see if there's a way that works for you for supporting us, whether it's the Patreon, whether it's making a purchase with the code podcast15, whether it's just sharing this episode with someone else. That'll take you seconds. Find what we're doing. Engage. Enjoy. Don't forget, we've got a Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio Behind the Scenes, to go deeper on this episode or the other episodes or anything. You know, some good conversation about stuff over there. So check it out. Looking for some training programs? Don't forget, we've got programs that start it free, like our Flex program, that will extend and empower you as a martial artist. You can find those at whistlekickprograms.com or, you know, actually they're at whistlekick.com too. We, we put this stuff all over the place to make it easy for you. So check it out. If you have guest suggestions, let me know. Jeremy at whistlekick.com. Our social media is at whistlekick. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. <laughs>